Ah, Pepsi. Ever the second fiddle. Never has a product been so synonymous with apologetic substitution. Pepsi has a uniquely mythic presence in culture. So many controversies and odd decisions. The time they got in a lawsuit because someone called their bluff over a military jump jet. The time they released a powerful protest ad that united the nation in making fun of them. The time they became a naval power. This one didn't actually happen, but the real story is just as interesting. How does one brand manage to make the news so many times, just in the past 30 years? It boggles the mind. That said, we're not here to talk about any of those certified Pepsi moments. No, we're interested in something a little more... breathtaking. Let's talk about the Pepsi doc. Wait, wait, what is that? Welcome to my corner. Grab a Pepsi. Settle in. It's gonna get weird. In late 2008, Pepsi announced that they would be redesigning their entire image. Gone were the water droplets and capital letters the public had come to expect, and even the iconic Pepsi globe would see a dramatic facelift. The new design was mocked almost immediately for, well, being the same logo, just with a slightly different wavy bit. And for looking like the Obama logo. Oh, and for reportedly costing Pepsi a million dollars to commission. But no one cared that much, and the redesign began rolling out just as the new year rolled in. The new cans were trendy and minimalistic, using the same flat aesthetic that every other company was switching to at the time. The new logo would also have different variations. Diet Pepsi saw the logo get a thinner white stripe, and Pepsi Max would get a logo with a thicker one. Oh, clever. But soon, on a fateful Monday that February, just months after the redesign had officially launched, a new Reddit user by the name of Pepsi Sucks made their first appearance in the comments of this post making fun of the new logo. That's <laughs> a pretty good actually. And changed Pepsi history forever. Haha, <laughs> I've created a new account just to post this. I have a funny story, which I should probably not share at all with Reddit, or really anyone. I work freelance in the industry, and one of my clients did some of the Pepsi spots which are on air. During the initial treatment, the advertising agency which won the Pepsi contract for the redesign sent over the design guidelines and a presentation on the design process of the new logo. I happened to be able to overhear a conversation regarding the new logo, and actually had to interrupt because I've never heard a discussion over anything so ludicrous in my life. I happened to nab a copy of the PDF, and have to share it. It really hammers in the stereotype of advertising in general, and the complete idiocy that goes into marketing. I really suggest reading till the end. It just gets better and better. Thus I present to Reddit, the Pepsi gravitational field. The user themselves would appear on Pepsi threads for another month or so, before ultimately disappearing forever. The document they had provided, however, for our purposes, the Pepsi doc, would go on to be spread around the internet, shared by news sites, and laughed at by advertising publications the world over. Pepsi had paid a million dollars for an incoherent, self-important manifesto of a brand pitch, and everyone knew it. Some would go on to doubt its legitimacy. Was it a fake? Or, more likely, an attempt at a viral marketing stunt? Now before we get into the doc itself, and we're getting there, don't worry, I want to set the record straight on the authenticity of the document we're about to look at. This is indeed a real pitch that was actually used as part of the Pepsi redesign. The proof will come. With that out of the way, I don't think we can delay this any longer. Cue the music, because it is time for us to enter the Pepsi-verse. Alright, let's get breathtaking in here. I like the insinuation that on the Access Soup Convention Innovation, Pepsi's new logo still only sits like three-fourths of the way up. I get it, you gotta pace yourself. Can we acknowledge the fact that this document has, within the span of three pages, gone directly from Let's design a new logo into Okay, so the history of art is really fascinating. 5,000 years of shared ideas? What is this, Shen Yun? Okay, so immediately we're claiming that all of art history has been building up to the Pepsi redesign. What is this timeline thing? Why why is the timeline made of circles? Are these circles the Pepsi logo? Am I supposed to be seeing something here? Okay, this isn't relevant, but what the fuck is this one? What What is this? The Pepsi DNA finds its origin in the dynamic of perimeter oscillations. I'm sorry, what the fuck does that mean? Yes, Pepsi. Curves can be extrapolated into ovals. How is this helping? Hey, wait a minute! At the end, they're adding rectangles! Okay, so now we're learning about the golden ratio. Earth is a globe, Pepsi is a globe. Earth has magnetic fields, Pepsi has magnetic fields. Earth has magnetic dynamics? You bet your ass Pepsi has magnetic dynamics. Why does this page have to give us a full height explanation of the fact that things look different at different angles? Oh look, they've got a Pepsi for every mood. 
This one is sleeping. All right, color. Let's let's do colors. I know colors. Let's get into colors. All right, Pepsi. That's cool. That's blue. Pepsi Max. That's cool and fresh. So it's blue, but a bit lighter. Wait, Pepsi not fresh. Caffeine free Pepsi. That's energetic and balanced. So it's clearly yellow. Wait, why is the one without caffeine the energetic one? Diet Pepsi. Cool rich and fresh so it's fresh code for aspartame caffeine free diet pepsi cool light and fresh so it's white why isn't this one energetic or balanced it's got the same amount of no caffeine so tell me why would pepsi have a gravitational pull are you implying with these diagrams that pepsi warps reality are we trying to get people to look around the pepsi instead of at it why does this diagram not actually have the guy looking at the pepsi why are there more Pepsis in each diagram? Why is the Pepsi proposition proposing that we put the Pepsi at a 45 degree angle from the direction the aisle is facing? Nope, I got nothing for this. Is the proposal giant Pepsi orb placed in every supermarket? Because I, I, I agree that that would sell more Pepsi, but I feel like giant intimidating product orb would probably sell anything you put in it. The Pepsi orbits. Pepsi planet. Pepsi galaxy. Pepsi universe. So we know the doc's stupid, but why isn't this video over yet? To understand that, we'll have to meet the man behind the Pepsi duck. But just what kind of person could dream up something as fantastical as this? It's time for us to meet the hero of our story. Ladies, gentlemen, and all in between, it is my honor to introduce you to Peter Arnell. Peter Eric Arnell was born on April 22, 1958, a New York native Peter graduated from Brooklyn Technical High School in 1976 and began his career in the field of design. And what a career! He formed the Arnell Group, you know, from the dog, in the early 80s, and immediately got to work creating exceptionally successful brands and advertisements. He designed the logo for Donna Karen's second fashion line, DKNY. He was a creative lead on the famous Terry Tate Office Linebacker commercials. Later, he would work on the design for the McDonald's packaging that was used throughout the 2000s. He even branched out into architecture, helping Frank Gehry design the Brooklyn Arena. He developed a reputation as an iconic designer with a strong personality, almost as famous himself as any campaign he worked on. Some loved him, some hated him, but everyone could agree that he got results. Oh, and he did all this while on an impressive weight loss journey that saw him go from 400 pounds down to just 150. Truly, the man was unstoppable. It is at this point that I need to mention that Peter Arnell is, like many great men, absolutely insane. Peter's eccentricities start out relatively normal. Well, rich person normal. He has a collection of toy spaceships, a collection of more than a thousand pairs of vintage eyeglasses that are all fitted to his prescription, a collection of toy robots, and presumably a collection of times he's appeared on Martha Stewart. Oh, he does. It's his YouTube channel. He likes to tell people where to sit in meetings based on the mood he's in. He gets all his suits made for him in Rome by a guy named Giuseppe. He modified his jeep with flashing lights and a fire department radio. Despite not being a fireman, he allegedly carries a gun and an ankle holster. He denies that last one. It's also been reported here that he once made an assistant lean over while he played her behind like bongo drums. Do with that what you will. His madness often extends into his work. One of his more famous projects was an ad campaign for Samsung, where he was tasked with marketing microwaves to college students. He accomplished this with a campaign that, according to him, changed the course of Samsung's entire culture. He put a shirtless guy on a billboard. Samsung. He would return to this particular well more than once, making an ad for Rockport shoes that contained no shoes, and an ad for Donna Karen hosiery that contained no hosiery. This is also the man that convinced Gwyneth Paltrow to name her company Goop. His reason was that all billion dollar internet companies have double O's in their names. Yeah. In 2009, he claimed that the Super Bowl ad he had created for Sobe Life Water, which, like everything else in 2009, was released in 3D, would thus be as monumental a moment for advertising as Thomas Edison's first motion pictures were for cinema. The ad in question? driven by a whole new technology, um, which is um, 3D technology, so it'll be historic because it'll be the first time ever. Uh, 
uh, and it's kind of like, you know, um, Edison and actualities, right? When those first movies ran. Yeah. ran out of them when he would show water flying out of a, a dam, he would, you know, um, uh, people would actually, be, they, they didn't know how to deal with it, so it's so Another of his weirdest projects I feel compelled to mention is the Peapod, an electric car he designed for Chrysler that looks like a golf cart and uses an iPod as its infotainment screen. And it couldn't go faster than 25 miles per hour. This one really isn't just Peter being crazy so much as it is Chrysler being crazy, but he did take the opportunity to name it after himself. Unfortunately, the Peapod would never get the chance to carry people around town as Chrysler went bankrupt and killed the project. Perhaps a sign. In 2010, he wrote a self-help book, Shift, detailing his dramatic weight loss and offering advice for others looking to follow in as an example. And hey, I could stand to lose a few pounds. So I read it. Let's find out what's inside. He spends the entire first chapter detailing his obsession with oranges. He claims to eat between 20 and 50 oranges a day, and that his hands are stained orange from the sheer volume of oranges that he eats. He has assistants to notice when his orange bowl is empty and refill it. Multiple times a day. Also this quote, I'm constantly peeling oranges. But truth be told, the oranges peeled me as well. That's what they've done for a long time. They've peeled away layers within me. They convinced me that I could change. Okay, this wasn't in the script, but what the fuck are with these dolls? Why did he have dolls made of him to show off his weight loss? What the fuck? He also insists, not once, not twice, but three times across several chapters of the book, that a great strategy for weight loss is to go out to eat at fancy restaurants every night, talk to the owners and chefs, and have them design new menus for your diet. A strategy that is far less effective when you aren't a rich New York ad exec. I decided to go out to dinner every single night. It's easy to be careful about what you eat at home, but if you hide away, a part of you will always be yearning to get out to your favorite restaurants and order your favorite foods. I chose my favorites, Dal Silvano, Nobu, and Hatsuhana, all first-rate Manhattan restaurants with amazing menus. My favorite was the Arnell Salad, a mixture of grilled chicken strips, chickpeas, beets, onions, and tomatoes, an assortment of different lettuces for variety and texture, and a very light vinaigrette dressing. More often than not, it looked so good that people I was eating with, or sometimes people in nearby tables, decided they also wanted Arnell salads. I'm sorry, I just love that he needed to brag that the salad named after him was so popular that it turned heads. I, I seriously considered cutting this bit, but the salad thing just gets me. Here are some other highlights from the book. In a true pro-branding move, the only chapter that does not contain a personal anecdote is the one about acknowledging failure. What an unfortunate segue that is. In 2009, he helped Tropicana launch a brand new packaging redesign. The new packaging dropped the iconic orange getting murdered by a barber pole design and replaced it with a newer convenience store house brand design that was generic, confusing, and oh look, the cap's a little orange. Aww. The redesign was a disaster. Tropicana buckled under the weight of public onslaught and rolled back the design less than a month later, and a bright orange stain was left on Peter's reputation. It was the oranges that had given him his life back, but now, it was the oranges that would threaten to take it all away. It was around the same time that the Pepsi Doc leaked. Remember the Pepsi Doc? This is a video about the Pepsi Doc. And this did not help. The giggling could be heard around the world. Peter Arnell, famed design legend and fellow YouTuber, was the talk of the town once more, but for the worst reason possible. The rumors circled. He was pretentious. He was a fraud. He was past his prime. A disgraced egomaniac, or just the unfortunate scapegoat of an industry desperate to prove it wasn't entirely as pompous as he was. Who's to say? In any case, the nail in the coffin came and the article broke. Newsweek's Daniel Lyons had been miraculously invited into Peter's world, and what he found would cement his reputation once and for all. Lyons destroyed him. In his efforts to prove that he was still the genius people once believed he was, Peter came off as increasingly desperate. Lyons would latch onto this desperation and run with it. Arnell claims it doesn't bother him, but when you spend some time around him, you quickly realize that A, he's extremely insecure, B, he knows this mess has damaged him, and C, he wants to move past this as quickly as possible. That's probably why he agreed to let me spend two days following him around. Lyons is witness to much Peter insanity. He asks strangers on the street what they think of the Tropicana redesign, 
He complains that he'll be remembered as Peter Tropicana or Nell, and he flaunts his connections poorly. There's a phone call with someone named Jay. Arnell puts the call on speakerphone. In case I don't recognize the voice, he stage whispers to me. It's Jay Leno. Afterward, he calls Ben Silverman, co-chairman of NBC Entertainment, and Rudy Giuliani, but can't get them on the phone. They even attend a meeting about the Peapod, resulting in what might be the most succinct portrait of the man ever put to page. The meeting quickly turns weird, however, as Arnell, chomping oranges and spitting out seeds, starts expounding on Magritte's Sin en Pan Peep, Dadaism, Merritt Oppenheim's fur teacup at the Museum of Modern Art, the way Martha Stewart examines the leaves of a flower, the logo for the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, the style of Yves Saint Laurent dresses, wristwatches, polar bears stranded on ice floes, the website of Jenny Craig. The poor software guys, who've never met Arnell and didn't know what to expect, just sit there looking befuddled but trying their best to play along. Perhaps most damning of all, for our purposes, are his reflections on the Pepsi redesign. It's all bullshit, he said. A logo on a can of soda? Please. My life is bullshit. The article's worth a read. I'll leave a link in the description. I'm leaving a ton out, mostly to avoid slandering this poor man. It is not kind to him. But for our purposes, there is one more piece of information to look at. And here it is. Lion's words backed up by the man himself. Some thought it might be a hoax. It wasn't. The doc is real. And that was that. Between the doc, the Tropicana fiasco, the article, and increasing allegations of his poor bossery, the suits had had enough, and in 2011, he was fired from his own firm. He would later go on to sue the company, for what might be the most Peter Arnell reason imaginable. In the lawsuit, Mr. Arnell insisted that Omnicom return an expansive library, bought partially with company money, or pay him about $1 million. According to the complaint, the library contained rare, unique, one-of-a-kind, signed artists' volumes, first editions, photographs, catalogs, photography volumes, volumes of important works of architecture, and Mr. Arnell's personal portfolios. They are, the lawsuit said, the tools with which Mr. Arnell conducts his intellectual business life. He's just, he's my favorite person. This is the best person. He is my favorite person. Peter would take a short break from advertising before returning in 2013 to work for the vitamin company GNC. These days, he largely focuses himself on personal creative projects. Good for him. A lifelong photographer, he held his first exhibition in 2014, and, following the global catastrophe whose name we dare not speak, he released a short film slash photo reel about New York's perseverance and strength. And look, he has a new book coming out in August. Fancy. Pepsi, for their part, would continue to use Arnell's logo, and with some minor tweaks, rip thin Diet Pepsi logo and thick Pepsi Max logo, also rip Pepsi Max, the branding is in use to this day. The mockery that came with the redesign proved short-lived, and today the logo stands largely unchallenged. As for the dock itself, it would slowly fade into the annals of history. Or maybe the Arnells. Or maybe that's stupid. When we started down this rabbit hole, I asked you a simple question. What kind of person could dream up something as fantastical as the Pepsi dock? And now, at the end, as we come down from our collective high, I ask you another question. Could it have been anyone else? There may still be some who claim that the doc is fake, that it leaked on purpose, that he lied about it to Newsweek, but I wholeheartedly believe that it is the sincere, insane work of a sincerely insane man. If for nothing else, he never would have let the Reddit account that leaked it accidentally call him Steve. So what's the lesson here? I don't think there is any. I wanted to know the truth behind the Pepsi doc, and to my own satisfaction, I found it. Sorry to have dragged you along this journey with me. Maybe next time we can learn about something you want to know. But until then, remember, the next time you peel an orange, it might just peel you back. Hey, do you want to do heroin with me? Eh, I prefer Coke. Wait. Wait. <laughs>